Hi, I'm Kathleen Sabo of New Mexico Ethics Watch, and this is Ethics Now, conversation about ethics in everyday life. Our guest today is Dr. Tracy Collins. She is the Dean of the College of Population Health at the University of New Mexico here in Albuquerque. Dr. Collins, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Now, I, I was reading in advance that you were hired in early 2019, and, and here you are in New Mexico during the pandemic. How, how is that for you? Well, you know, I started um, with the University of New Mexico in July of 2019. Okay. And, you know, six months into my position, you know, I'm really enjoying everyone. It's, I'm learning a lot, meeting a lot of people and starting to um, enjoy socializing with folks from UNM and others. And then suddenly the pandemic hit yeah. and it was time to stay at home um, just as I was thinking about traveling around the state and getting out and seeing all the sites. So it's been an interesting journey. I think um, the pandemic obviously has hit the entire world negatively, but there are some positive little silver linings that are there. One of them is that it's really pushed public health and population health to the forefront. I, people have always known about public health, but really appreciating the impact of public health with healthcare delivery to address this pandemic has really been um, highlighted. Well, and we've got a governor whose background is public health. I've, I've heard a lot of people be very happy about that with the way things have been handled. Obviously there are some people who aren't happy, but are you, um, are you, are you, in touch with her? Are you glad about the fact that you have someone governing the state you're in right now who, who has a public health background? I'm very encouraged. I, I had, I've had a chance to meet her. I've interacted quite a bit with Secretary Conkel. Hmm. Um, and so I, it's very positive, I think, for the state that we have a governor with a public health background. And especially during this time of COVID-19, I think she's done a phenomenal job no, and a lot of people, including myself, would agree with you. And we'll just acknowledge that some don't. Uh, so I have read that the university school, uh, the College of Population Health, is one of three in the country. So what is population health and how does it differ from public health, please? Sure. So population health is really the science of improving health outcomes for diverse communities by engaging disciplines largely public health and healthcare delivery. It's really um, a version of public health that's advanced because public health has been doing things for years to address health promotion, prevention, interventions, the social determinants of health. But now when we think about really working closely with healthcare systems, that's population health. So it's bringing public health and healthcare delivery together. Well, and I read on your bio, uh, UNM, that you study racial disparities and the impact of serious vascular disorders. So you seem like the perfect person to be in the position of running the population health school. This is what you this is what you've done for years. Well, I appreciate that, and yes, it, uh, my career started with trying to understand why there were differences by race and ethnicity in rates of lower extremity non-traumatic amputations. And from there, I uh, branched into areas of how do you talk to your doctor, so communication, and then understanding diseases that relate to amputations, one largely being peripheral artery disease or poor leg circulation. And so a lot of my work over the years has been understanding how does this disease impact patients and how does that vary by race, the disease being peripheral artery disease? And then understanding what we can do in a primary care setting, given that I'm a primary care doctor, to address these issues. And also kind of what are the outcomes that are occurring in the hospital setting with patients who have peripheral artery disease? Do they go on to surgery, amputation? Are we really doing a good job modifying their risk factors? And then I progressed to doing trials where I'm in, um, enrolling patients into a study and delivering a behavioral intervention and seeing if that has any benefit to reduce the progression of the peripheral artery disease. 
Well, and now we've got COVID-19 where we're seeing disparate impacts on various uh, ethnicities. So is this something that the college is, is focusing on or, or participating in looking at? Yes, we have um, a few projects ongoing. One is to look at improving messaging to the Navajo Nation because the groups at risk, besides having an older age, even though COVID-19 attacks everyone, you're, everyone's at risk, but when you're at risk for poor outcomes, it's being immunocompromised, older age, minorities, um, certainly having uh, diabetes or chronic kidney disease. But when you think about the racial disparities and what's happening with COVID-19, it's largely impacting Native Americans, so the Navajo Nation, mm -hmm. also Latinos, and also African Americans. So one of the studies that I'm working on with a faculty member who's Navajo is to look at uh, developing an app to improve messaging mm -hmm. to the Navajo Nation and to make it culturally appropriate. So in language that people would like to see, um, that would help or would resonate with them understanding the importance of physical distancing if you can, you know, not hugging or kissing, washing your hands, wearing a mask, just making that messaging really concrete and appropriate for the Navajo Nation. So that's one project. The other is that we're looking at, and we'll wait to see if we get the funding, to understand healthcare attitudes and behaviors among Latinos and African Americans who've been impacted by COVID-19. Um, and to understand rates of seroconversion among these populations and to compare that to non-Hispanic whites here in New Mexico. Well, and I have to ask what seroconversion is to, for, for myself and others who might not have that knowledge, please. Yes, sorry for the lingo. No, um, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so really looking at antibody development. So okay. if you had COVID-19, do you develop antibodies, basically, it's the seroconversion part. Okay, and so good luck with those studies and thank you for, for doing them and, and being aware of the need for those things. So I wanna know what drew you to work in public health and now population health? What, was, what, yeah. what brought you there? So when I was a medical student, I uh, was on a rotation, my surgery rotation, and I was rotating at a VA hospital in Oklahoma City. And I noticed that a lot of the minority veterans had had at least one amputation. So I started thinking, what is going on here? So as I moved forward in my career, finishing medical school, going to residency in internal medicine, towards the end of internal medicine residency, I recognized I was at a path where I could go either one way or the other, kind of a junction there in the road. And I basically talked with some senior physicians and I asked, I said, you know, I really like seeing patients but I'm kind of wanting to do more. I want to have a say in how we deliver care. And that led me to complete a general medicine fellowship, which what was part of that was getting a master's in public health. So really the draw to me initially in public health was the ability to do research and come up with interventions that would inform healthcare. It's further blossomed now into having a say in policy and doing more work in the arena of public health. So is that initial question of what is going on here? Am I seeing something? Am I just, is it my own bias that's leading me to think there's some difference here? But when in fact I began to look at the data, there are clearly disparities in amputations and in the disease, peripheral artery disease. Yeah. And, and, you know, just briefly, why? why? Why is that? Why are the differences? So it's multifactorial, but one of the issues was kind of the delay in when you're actually seen for issues around poor leg circulation. So when you're from a more affluent community, you're gonna be quicker potentially to think about why am I walking slower and have resources like health insurance and access to a physician to go and talk about these symptoms. In the underserved groups, it's problematic as far as having good insurance, having access, and being available to go see your physician, and then dismissing symptoms, just thinking it's a part of getting older, like the cramping in the back of my legs, the discomfort, walking slower, I'm just getting older, when in fact it's not age, it's having this disease. Well, you know, are we doing enough with regard to COVID-19 to make sure that 
at least at this point, some of the things that might lead to a disparity in mortality or, um, or survival, that, that people in underserved populations or minority populations have access to the things that they need, whether it's testing, hospitalization, care of some kind, just even looking after. Are we doing enough now in, in New Mexico? New Mexico, we're moving in the right direction. We recently had a massive screening in a largely African-American community. And the state has done a, a great job around the, you know, just providing testing sites. Some of the challenges, which are more structural that, and will take years to undo, are that minorities are more likely to have jobs that put them at risk. I mean, they're more likely to be the bus driver or the worker at the grocery store. So are we providing masks and protection for these frontline workers who are not the healthcare workers, but they're in the front lines? And we need them. We need the grocery store workers. We need the bus drivers. So there's that piece. There's also the piece of having those chronic conditions that put you at risk for having poor outcomes with COVID-19. And those go back to the social determinants of health which those started in our country years ago. This is like years of racism and problems that will take years to undo, but we need to make the effort. So why does like one family member after another have hypertension or have diabetes? You know, yeah, you might think genetics, but genetics make up about 20% of what's related to that. And the others, about 60% that are related to those social determinants of health, which are things like your housing, transportation, employment, social justice, and just having the same privileges and opportunities that mainstream America has. You know, all of that are things that, that I've been hoping we come out of this with a real plan for how to address them. I, I haven't seen that quite yet. I keep, but, uh, but that certainly is my hope. And I think the hope of many that, that, uh, that, that it becomes so clear and we become so uh, involved with taking care of each other that right. we make those kind of improvements. Absolutely. And I think in the healthcare system, when we think, think of promotors or community health workers, are these people reaching out to the most vulnerable to make sure they understand what they're supposed to be doing to protect themselves um, if, they, if they have COVID or before they acquire it, making sure they're preventing themselves from being exposed to the best that they can. Um, so there are those steps. And then engaging the community themselves in conversations. Like what is it that we can do differently that would make things better? I mean, there's a long list, but we have to start somewhere. And you say that you feel like we're moving in the right direction here in New Mexico. I've seen things that encourage me. I wouldn't say that we've completely um, done everything we should. I mean, there, when we think about the sites that provide the testing, right. how about people who don't have the transportation to get to those sites? Um, and so, again, it would take a community effort. I don't think one person is going to solve all this. But I think we're moving in the right direction, but there's still room for improvement. Well, I've said this before on another episode, the bad news is that it looks like it's going to be with us for a while. The good news is it gives us time yeah. to, to make some of these essential changes to make society more equitable, both in health care and beyond. Right. So. Absolutely. So I think, again, uh, Governor Grisham has done a phenomenal job. I just think there are certain things that have been in place for so many years that undoing them and improving them is going to take time, just as you mentioned. Yeah. Well, now, in, in other episodes, we've had a bioethicist on, we've had a, uh, a restaurant owner on, we've had a journalist. We're talking about ethics throughout this. Uh, we had people on, lawyers who were talking about the ethics of people keeping people in prison and jails during the pandemic. And so there are some things that are arising when we talk about ethics with everyone, and it, whether it's honesty and integrity, transparency. But the main thing that keeps arising is when we talk about ethics is it's more than just ourselves. It's being aware of and doing things for our community, for the, for, uh, you know, the other, 
not yeah. just not just ourselves and in that way i think of public health and population health as going hand in hand with ethics because public health is really about the greater community isn't it right there's a large component of public health that's about prevention and health promotion and community so absolutely i agree with you when we think about COVID 19 and we think about protecting self yeah you want to keep that physical distance i'm not going to say social i'm going to say physical about at least six feet um and then the hand washing but also wearing the mask and when you think about wearing the mask what were the masks we're wanting you to wear in the community is really so that you protect your fellow citizens and not yourself per se. So from an ethical standpoint, when we think about public health, we need to be clear on communicating as soon as we know new information about COVID-19, we need to get that reliable and valid information out. Um, we also need to be clear that when we talk about wearing a mask, it's not about ideology, it's not a, a bipart, it's not about political, it's about protecting your, your community and being a good citizen. And that's a part of ethics. Absolutely. You know, one of the one of the issues, and maybe some people don't quite understand, is that it's a novel virus. It's a new virus. So information that we thought was correct at one point science will tell us differently after we've had enough cases after we've had enough evidence after we've had enough research and i i think this is something that that public health um you know ha probably has to struggle with because the message changes especially with with regard to masks right i mean when i was first interviewed about COVID 19 uh probably a week after the stay-at-home order what i had to say then <laughs> versus what I'm saying now, you know, I was really concerned about surfaces and other things. And now it's really about the amount of time that you spend in contact with someone who's positive and taking the appropriate precautions. So absolutely every day, you know, it's reading the news, reading the England Journal of Medicine, other journals, and just figuring out what's the latest information about COVID-19 or this novel coronavirus um, because it is changing daily and it's interesting that this particular virus is associated with vascular disorders yes. that we've not seen before and we're seeing this in younger people so there is a lot that we're learning about COVID-19 I just look forward to the day when we can say that we have a really good vaccine and I remain hopeful because unlike with HIV we do have people who are recovering mm -hmm. from COVID-19, which means that they are clearing the virus. Um, so there's hope for a vaccine. And Dr. Fauci did point that out, which I found very positive. It was good. That is a good distinction because I read something yesterday about some characteristics that make it similar to HIV. And I, I, I'm not a scientist, so I can't for the life of me remember what they are right now. But, but that's a great distinction to point out that people are actually recovering. Yes. So, so where would you suggest that listeners, um, you know, consumers of information go to get the best, most current information about risks? I mean, I, you know, I, I, I get it from a hodgepodge of, of yeah. places and I, and that I trust and, you know, and I've, I've read now that surface, um, surface um, interaction is not as bad as we thought it was and that right. you know it's uh, it, you know indoors it's sort of time uh, time the time you get exposed yes. to, the, to the seriousness of the virus and right. potentially indoors in a confined space but where do, where would you say to go to get the best information so for the state i'd say go to our department of health website I'd also say CDC, mm -hmm. there's also NIH, and then Johns Hopkins. Those are kind of my go-to. And there's also the World Health Organization, but that's more globally. But certainly starting locally with our Department of Health website would be a good place to go. You know, I have to say that there may be some people who are listening who don't trust one or more of those sources when i mean i i don't think of myself as a naive person but when did this distrust for public health happen 
I mean, I mean, it's, has it been brewing for a while? I imagine it has with people who don't believe in vaccinations and things, but, but it's sort of discouraging. There is a sense of wanting to be independent and to make your own decisions. And somehow when you have government agencies, they're perceived as, uh, for, for some, as being suspect. Like, do I really believe them? What do I, what do I believe for myself? I have my own independence here, mm -hmm. land of the free. And there's also issues with, given with COVID-19, there's so many things are changing yeah. that it becomes like, do I believe it? Are they going to change their mind tomorrow? It's not that the people are changing their minds. It's just we're learning more. Right, right. Yeah. So, you know, there is the distrust. Um, and so it's a matter of messaging and working through that. I think one of the issues now with COVID-19 is the impact of trying to flatten the curve on the economy. And that's gotten people who feel like their livelihood is at risk, mm -hmm. saying that, you know, the treatment is worse. You know, what we're doing now to prevent this is worse than the actual disease itself. And unfortunately, COVID-19 is determining how we behave. We're not telling it what to do. It's telling us what it's going to do. And we've just got to be cautious, even with the reopening. We've got to make sure that people are distancing. If they're going to go to a restaurant, please, for now, with a very hot weather, and if you have an umbrella, sit outside, you know, and just do things to keep yourself and your family safe. Um, that's what I can recommend right now. You know, I tell you, I was saying to my kids that I think it'll be a long time before we sit inside in a, in a restaurant. And, I'm, and we're lucky. We're lucky here. You know, I have family in Connecticut where it's cold a great deal of the year. We can be outside. We can yeah. take that precaution for the balance of the year and, and be okay with it. You know, I, we probably, most people have now seen the videos of the gathering at the Lake of the Ozarks uh, that that huge crowd with no social distancing, no masks, and then, a, and then a request from the governor of Missouri for all those folks to quarantine for 14 days. I mean, that, that seems like the ethical thing to do once you've, once you've decided you're willing to put yourself at risk, then you don't go home to your family. Then you, then, I mean, still I worry about the healthcare workers who now have to take care of anybody who gets sick, but at least you're, you're protecting your mother, your father, your grandmother, your infant cousin, whoever it might be. Absolutely, yes. You would hope that the folks who decided to go out and enjoy themselves that way for that weekend, that they would do the ethical thing, and that's to quarantine. I'm glad the governor sent the message out. Um, it's unfortunate that somehow there is this thinking that it's not gonna happen to me, and that may be so, but even if it doesn't happen to you, if you're carrying it, you can expose your loved ones, just as you mentioned, or you know, friends and so or coworkers. So it really we're gonna see in the next several weeks the impact of that decision to hang out in such close quarters with others. We will, we will. And you know, I'm not wishing ill on anyone. I mean, if People can, let's talk a little bit about herd immunity because we hear that, that talked about quite a bit. And if people can develop that, I mean, that's, that's a good thing, isn't it? It is, but typically we don't want to throw people into the fire to make that happen. You know, we want it to evolve. We want the herd immunity to develop so that, you know, as we think about developing a vaccine, once we have a certain number of people who've been uh, treated or actually receive the vaccine and they have immunity, then they can be the folks who protect those who decide not to get it. We'd like for as many people to get it as possible, but about 70%, 60 to 70% would be kind of the rate for that herd immunity, where we would have enough protection to protect those who've not yet either been exposed to COVID or have the vaccine. You know, I, I read that there's a particular uh, discrete community in the Bronx, in New York, where 45% of people have been found to have antibodies. Wow. It, it's, pretty, it's pretty astounding. And as you might imagine, it's a, it's a minority community. Mm -hmm. um, but do we know exactly what, 
what the antibodies, having the antibodies does yet? Do we know whether we're protected for how long we're protected? I mean, is, is getting an antibody test and, and saying, yes, you have the antibodies, is that your, your golden ticket? No, it is not. As of today, we don't know what it means. We just know that you've uh, been exposed, you've converted or that uh, developing the antibodies. And if you have cleared the antigen and had the antibodies, we feel like you're in a position not to expose others. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, even that is questionable. So all we know at this point is that people are developing antibodies. Having the antibodies we can't say one way or the other that, oh yeah, that you're, you're safe. So even if you have the antibodies, still take precaution with you know, hand washing, distancing, wearing a mask. Um, but we will learn more moving forward. We're gathering that data and then ultimately, eventually, we will know what it means. Well, and is there a reliable antibody test? I mean, what I've read is there are multiple tests and they, many of them have, have problems. Is it time for people in New Mexico to get an antibody test? You know, I would say at this point to allow the state to guide you on when you should go and be tested for the antibodies. Um, that certain tests are more reliable than others. The more rapid tests and certainly at-home tests are not reliable as of today. Uh, we know certain labs are doing a good job in the state with testing for the antibodies. So I would rely on those labs versus anything at home. Now we've talked about uh, precautions people can take to protect themselves and others. We now have touched on antibodies. What, what else can we do now, both um, ethically and to protect public health? I mean, the people who are listening to this podcast, what more can we do? I would encourage people to be patient, to continue doing the things that are gonna keep you safe. So even though we're reopening, I would encourage people to, yeah, support your local restaurants and businesses, but do it in a way that's safe. Perhaps do a little bit more carry out. If you absolutely have to go and get out of the house, sit on the patio outside, make sure that you're not having large gatherings. Um, if you want to have some people over to your home, Make sure that you are physically distancing and doing it appropriately. Have them maybe bring their own food, their own utensils, and you have your food and utensils and you keep apart, but you have your conversation. And, you know, make sure you're thinking about physical distancing and not social. Don't lose your connections to your friends. I mean, there's still the Zoom way of hanging out, but if you absolutely have to have a few people over, just make sure you can space out. But I think at this point for people to be patient and please continue to read the newspaper and understand where we are in a given day with COVID-19 because things continue to change. You know, it's funny because when I think about potentially having someone over, I was thinking about asking them to bring their own utensils. So I'm happy to hear you saying that. The other thing I want to mention is I'm seeing people now um, do creative things um, in terms of plastic sheeting and gloves and being able to hug people yeah. they haven't hugged, hugged in months. I mean, you know, hugging is, releases oxytocin and, you know, we, we yeah. all want that. You know, we, I, think, I think we need it. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. Definitely. So, I mean, if you're going to have guests over and you can have them in the backyard, you know, you yeah. can space out. Yes, but I did see a video of a woman hugging her mother through plastic because she hadn't hugged her in so long. So just sort of sort of heartwarming and heartbreaking at the same time. Absolutely. Well, well Dr. Collins, is there anything else you want to convey to our listeners, uh, either about what the School of Population Health is doing, the College of Population Health, or anything else that you want to make sure that people as ethical, responsible citizens are, are doing? Well, certainly for the college, you know, as you mentioned, we're, we were like the second college of its kind in the country. Um, and so we really are growing. We have a bachelor's program in population health. And then we have a master's in public health and we're working on a PhD program. So there's more to come. So stay tuned. And um, we're working on our website. And so at some point that'll be up and running. So you can check that out and get a better sense of the college. 
we really support communities and we want to continue to do so. So we encourage insight from others um, on what they feel like are hot topics or important areas to consider. Clearly right now, COVID-19 is the, the topic that everyone is focusing on. And so in the next six to nine months, hopefully we'll have more information on a vaccine for COVID-19. So I encourage patience and diligence in keeping abreast of the latest information. Well, and maybe we'll have an opportunity to have you back uh, once, once, things, once things develop, but it certainly sounds like a great career path for people to explore if they're interested in getting involved in uh, the medical field or the epidemiological field. Uh, so congrats on, on you know, one of, having one of the first colleges here in the, in the U.S. That's pretty amazing that it's right here. Yes, and thank you. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. So I want to say thank you to our guest today, Dr. Tracy Collins, and I want to say thank you for joining us. You can connect to every Ethics Now episode on www.ethicsnow.org or on all major podcast platforms. Visit our Ethics Watch Facebook page to suggest topics or guests or email us at ethicsnowshow at gmail.com. Again, thank you, Dr. Collins, and thanks for listening. And see you next time on Ethics Now. Be well.